Hallelujah. Let's welcome our teacher here tonight. Holy Spirit, we just thank you so much for being our instructor tonight. We just ask you to teach us all things that pertain to life and godliness. We ask that you would breathe upon the word of God tonight, that these principles would become living word that would reign in our hearts. And I pray that you re-identify each of us tonight, not by who we were in our past life of sin and death, but who we are now in Christ Jesus since we've been born again, a new and living way that we may walk, live, move, and have our being in you, Holy Spirit. And just as the song we sing, Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. Teach us how to be one with you. Teach us how to be one with you. We love you and we thank you and we honor you, sir, here tonight. We thank you for teaching us. In Jesus' name we pray. If you're in agreement with that, amen. say amen. If you have your Bibles tonight, we're going to go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1. We were closing up here last week on this verse, and I am just convinced more and more every day I live that the most important message that the church can ever really embrace is the message of identification. Who you are in Christ Jesus. Our testimony is not self-pity. Our testimony is rehearsing the power of God's deliverance. You know, sometimes I think that believers too quickly go back into identifying who they were in their past instead of who they are in Christ. You know, when I share my testimony about my youth and about my young man years of rebellion and lawlessness, that testimony is only to show forth the power of God to deliver and to tell and encourage anyone in any condition, if he could do it for me, he could do it for anybody. That's the point of that testimony. Never to go back and to re-identify with that old man who was crucified in Christ. And if I'm crucified with him, the scripture says that I also will be resurrected with him. And the scripture says that I should begin to walk in the newness of life. I'm no longer an old creature feature. But now I'm a new creation in Christ. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation, never existing before. So we walk in that newness of life. I can't do righteous until I believe I am righteous. Why? How could a sinner do righteous? If I still identify with who I was instead of who I am, I'll act out of who I was instead of acting out of who I am. But each one of us have to get a very solid, strong foundation in that message of identification if we're going to walk victorious in this life. And if we're going to experience what we've been teaching about, this walk of faith and understanding, tonight I'm calling this message authority and the spirit of faith. Because we're walking, I believe, many days in our lives well below the authority that God's given us to walk in. We're not enforcing kingdom laws the way the Lord told us to because we don't really believe it. Until you believe you're righteous in Christ, again, you will not act righteous. 1 Corinthians 6, 1 Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints? Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? You know, very. I, I, I've been in church for many, many years now, since 1982, consistently. And do you know there are very few Christians that would ever, 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 Submit a disagreement 
to a pastor for settlement and, and, and take that pastor's decision as if they would a judge in a court of law down the street here. I can't tell you how many times. Very seldom will a Christian ever submit to spiritual authority. In fact, they have, Christians have no problem walking down the street here and letting some, a, a judge who's not even a Christian judge them. And they'll accept that judgment as final. But how many of you have faith enough to accept the judgment of my, me or any other spiritual leader that you've submitted to in life as final word? How many of y'all have faith to do that? It's easy to say yes until it's time for me to look at you and say, I choose them and they're just them as right and you as wrong. All of a sudden, you'll find out how deep your faith is. Because most folks will rise up at that time and find another church. And then they'll go tell that other pastor their side of the story. But of course, that pastor never heard the other side of the story. It takes great faith to submit spiritually. Most Christians in this culture don't submit at all. They only walk in their own opinions. And like I say, the minute they don't agree, they just disengage, disappear, and they go somewhere else. And that's not right. Now, I'm not saying that any time you go somewhere else, it's not right because God moves people. We're not against that. I mean, I bless people coming and going here all the time. We've blessed, I don't know how many families in the last few months that have felt the Lord was relocating them because there are times God relocates. I'm talking about you leaving because you didn't get your way about something or, you know, I'm not talking about a, 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 um, a just, just some little thing. I'm talking about you just can't submit to authority. But yet you would submit to a natural authority. You would submit to Chief Martin back here, but you wouldn't submit to Pastor Dave. <laughs> You'd submit to a natural judge down here, but you wouldn't submit. And here Paul is rebuking the church for that. He says, dare any of you. That's a strong, dare any of you. In other words, it's a statement of Paul saying, I can't even believe you would do that. Dare any of you? Dare is a strong word. Dare any of you? Having a matter against another, go to the law before the unrighteous? And not before the saints? I want to challenge each of you to find points in your life where you can practice submission. Because you'll never be a better leader than you are a follower. You'll never be a better Christian than you are a servant. You'll never be a better brother. You'll never be a better father than you are a son. Think about that. And I want to encourage us all. You know, allow God's righteous judgments into your life. Allow the measurement of Christ into your life. Do you not know? The saints will judge the world? And if the world will be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge in the smallest matters? Well, you know why we're unworthy to judge in the smallest matters? Because we got the whole church saying, you ain't allowed to judge nobody for nothing. Come on. How many of y'all hear it every day in culture? You're not allowed to judge anybody for anybody, for anything. Baloney. You have to take judgment in context. Jesus warned against judging someone for doing something and you're guilty of the same thing. He warned against that. He warned against judging things unrighteously. He, learned, he warned against judging things prejudicially. He warned against unrighteous judgment. But he encouraged us in righteous judgment. He encouraged it. He goes on to say, do you not know, verse 2, the saints will judge the world? Wow. You better get to practicing. 
Do you not know the saints will judge the world? That's incredible. You're not allowed to judge anybody. No, you're supposed to judge all things. The Bible says, judge all things. Hold fast that which is good. He who is spiritual judgeth all things. The word judge means to measure against right and wrong. To measure against truth. I can judge anything if I measure it to truth. How do I know whether something's wrong? What does the Word say? If the Word says it's wrong, it's wrong. How do I... You know, we have... We have I was shocked uh, the, a couple of weeks ago. I, I got a... Uh, I was reading through one of my internet subscription deals to a leadership uh, blog thing. And they were saying how... There's a group, there's, a, there's an organization called the Exodus Organization, or it was an organization, they, they've disbanded now. And for the last 30 years, the Exodus ministry has been trying to help homosexuals who wanted to come out of their sin. They've been trying to help them. Well, they put out a letter saying that um, we're closing down the Exodus ministry and we would like to uh, give an apology to the homosexual community for judging you. And I'm like, and you know what, you know what I really believe happened? Probably some homosexuals got in charge. Probably some homosexuals that came out of homosexuality got in charge and then backslid. And you think the devil don't want a ministry shut down who's trying to bring people out of that lifestyle? That you judge homosexuals? Absolutely. Absolutely. Just like I'll judge an adulterer or a thief or a whoremonger or a drunkard. I'll judge any sinful behavior. Witches, will you judge a witch without question? If you're practicing witchcraft, I'll look any witch in the eye and say, you're going to hell, darling, unless you repent. Where does this goofy doctrine come out? That we don't walk in the authority of God to judge matters on the earth. Baloney with a capital B. You better go back and read your Bible again. You say, well, that's evil to judge. No, it's righteous to judge. It's evil to lie. And to tell someone who's bound in a sin that leads to death that they're okay with God is evil. That's an unrighteous judgment. And God condemns that kind of judgment. To tell them you're okay is a judgment. You're judging they're okay. You're judging someone who is in a sin that leads to death is okay. And you're confirming them in that. That's judgment. It's just unrighteous judgment. And you know, we're not here to pick on sinners. I'm trying to help people understand the penalty is coming. You're going to walk off the ledge. You're going to fall into eternity. That's it. I'm trying to, I will will scream from the housetops. Until I'm taken from this earth. Repent! For the kingdom of God is at hand. You know the old revivalists used to say it like this. Jesus didn't come preaching forgiveness. He came preaching repentance. And forgiveness is the fruit of repentance. Repentance isn't the fruit of forgiveness. Repentance comes before forgiveness. Read your Bible. Repentance comes before forgiveness. Let me ask you a question. If you don't repent, are you forgiven? No. So repentance, the preaching of repentance, brings the fruit of forgiveness of sins. And when we're forgiven freely, then we begin to freely forgive. But freely forgiven doesn't mean that we look at people still living in sin and we forgive them even though God didn't. That's unrighteous judgment. You know, sometimes in evangelism, we, we've, we, we're so afraid of, we're, we're so wanting to get another scratch on our pistol, so to speak. We're so wanting to get another number that we'll tell people things that aren't true to try to get them to say a prayer or do something. It's not truth. 
You know, if I walk up to someone who's in adultery and I tell them something like, you know, Jesus loves you so much. And if you just pray this prayer with me right now, your sins will be forgiven and you'll go to heaven when you die. But I don't tell them you've got to repent from your adultery. Then I stand guilty and their blood will be on my hands and required of my hands. And we'll both end up in judgment. That's, that's where we stand. So there is an authority in us to judge things. And to say there isn't is just ridiculous. But you know the world hates to be judged. They hate to be judged. Man, the world hates to be judged. They don't want nothing judged. They can't stand it when we pronounce judgment. Why? They don't want to be judged. You know what? When I was a sinner, I didn't want to be judged either. Why? I was in sin. But that doesn't mean we don't preach the righteousness of God in Christ. Now let's look at Luke 5.17. Luke 5, 17. Now it happened on a certain day he was teaching, and there were Pharisees and teachers of the law standing by. <laughs> Who had come out of every town of Galilee, Judea and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Then behold, men brought on a bed a man who was paralyzed, whom they sought to bring in and lay before him. And when they could not find how they might bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the housetop, let him down with his bed through the tiling into the midst before Jesus. Now look at verse 20. When he saw their faith. See, faith can be seen. Why? Why? Faith without works is dead being alone, but faith with works can be seen. When he saw their faith, he said to him, Man, your sins are forgiven you. When the scribes and Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered and said to them, Why are you reasoning in your hearts? Which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven you? Or to say, rise up and walk? But that you may know the Son of Man has power, which that word power is exousia, authority. But you might know the Son of Man has authority. No, he didn't say the Son of God. He said the Son of Man. There's a difference. He was the Son of God and the Son of Man. But he wanted us to know that the Son of Man has authority on the earth. Now let me ask you a question. What gave Jesus the right to forgive sins? Who knows? How about this? He didn't have any. What gave Jesus the right to forgive sins? He was sinless. His authority came from his righteousness. Are you agreeing with me? His authority came from his right standing. That's what gave him the power. So a sinner can't forgive sins. Why? He's a sinner too. He doesn't have that authority. Do I have authority to teach a man to drive a car if I've never driven a car? Do I have authority to teach someone to do something I've never done? I remember years ago, I was, uh, I was uh, watching a, a television program, and there was a guy who was a, um, one of the most well-known preachers in America at that time, and he had had an experience with the Spirit of God of deliverance, and he was teaching on the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and he was doing really good, and then all of a sudden he got to the gift of tongues and it was like confusion just went out of him and he had and and I was sitting there thinking why did all of a sudden he go from 
good solid teaching to confusion, the Spirit of God spoke to me. He said, he has no authority to teach on tongues because he's never spoken tongues. He has no experience in it. He has no standing in it. So he doesn't have any authority to teach on it. I can teach on speaking in tongues with great authority because I've spent literally tens of thousands of hours praying in the Spirit and speaking in tongues. So I can speak it with authority. When you have an experience and when you are an experience of something, you can share it with authority. Are you with me? So he wanted us to know the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Now, some people would say, well, that was only Jesus. He was the only one who had the authority on earth to forgive sins. But that's not what the Bible teaches. Immediately, he rose up before them, took up what he had been lying on, and departed to his own house, glorifying God. They were all amazed, and they glorified God and were filled with fear, saying, we've seen strange things here today. You know, when I began to get this understanding years ago, when I began to lead people with Christ, to Christ, I'm sorry, if I had led them into repentance and there was, there was a true heart repentance that I could discern, something was manifesting that fruit of repentance. And I did it many times last year as we were having our dramas and our altar calls. And I would look down and I would see the, the broken hearts and the, the people crying out, Jesus, save me. I would always do this, and I do this a lot. I'll, I'll say, now look me in the eye. Look me in the eye. And then I'll say, in the name of Jesus Christ, I declare to you, your sins are forgiven. And man, you just see them light up like a Christmas tree. Your sins are forgiven. Now, I have authority on earth. As any born-again child of God who is standing in the righteousness of God in Christ has authority to forgive sins. In fact, well, I don't get ahead of myself here. Look at Isaiah 53, 11 with me. I don't have any issue with forgiveness in the earth. I only have an issue with Preaching forgiveness without repentance. That's my issue with the church. And my issue with a lot of the, the, the theology being taught in churches. And those churches are, I think, they have kind of, it's deception. Any way you want to look at it, it's just religious deception. But to me, there's nothing scarier than confirming a person, confirming them, saying, you're okay with God. I confirm you when, in fact, their heart has never touched true repentance. Man, that's a scary place to live. Amen. Isaiah 53, 11. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide... The spoil with the strong. Because he poured out his soul to death. He was numbered with transgressions. He bore the sin of many. And made intercession for the transgressors. Now when Jesus makes intercession for the, transgression, uh, the transgressors. We know that he's praying for the repentance of the sinners. That's how you do it. You pray, Paul said it like this, that God might grant them a spirit to repent. I don't even believe we can truly repent without the Lord giving us a grace to do it. But I believe he giveth that grace to every man, else God would not be just. He gives every man the opportunity. Every man at some point in time is given the spirit of grace to repent. Then our natural will kicks in and we decide for ourselves where we will spend eternity. The scripture even gives us confirmation that even people who died without hearing Christ have a way of hearing him even after death. Because it says he went down into hell and he preached so that every man would have no, you know, there is no excuse. I don't know how the Lord does all of it, but I know he does it and I have faith that he does it. 
Some people say, well, how, what about someone who, who dies and they never heard the message of Jesus? There is a way the Lord has of getting them the message. I don't know how he's going to do it, but I know he's a just and righteous God. John chapter 20, verse 19. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, Peace be to you. As the Father sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Now look at verse 23. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Now, some believe that was only, you know, only the 12 or the 11 at that time, apostles, that was four. Well, let me ask you a question. Why would Jesus take 11 Christians and give them this authority and for the next 2,000 years, no one else? Does that even make any kind of sense? Why would Jesus say, you 11 guys, I'm going to give you the authority to forgive people's sins and retain people's sins. So as soon as you 11 are dead, that authority has gone from the earth. That don't even make sense. The scripture says in him all the promises are yes and all the promises are amen. In fact, there is a few places where Jesus differentiates the apostles from us in privilege. We read one last week. It says one thing about these 11 guys. It says they will judge the 12 tribes of Israel. We won't. We won't. They differentiate. You'll do that. He said the, the foundation or the government of the church is built on these 11 guys, not on you and I. These 11 guys had the foundation. They were the stones laid up against the cornerstone for the church. We don't have that. There are certain things these guys had privilege to we don't have. But at the same time... The promises given to them where there was not a differentiation of them and us, then that promises to us too. Scripture says, like for example in the book Acts, it says, when they saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Spirit was given. Well, guess what? Laying on of hands is a doctrine of the church. Not just for the eleven, but for all of us. Any believer who has faith who is filled with the Holy Spirit, can pray and get other people filled with the Holy Spirit. As soon as they begin to see, oh, that's how you do that, they did it, and it worked. And it's still working today. Matthew 16, verse 13. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, we, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say, I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said, but who do you say I am? Simon Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus answered, blessed are you Simon Barjona for flesh and blood hath not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter. And on this rock I will build my church. And the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he commanded the disciples that they should tell no one he was Jesus the Christ. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders, the chief priests, the scribes, and be killed and be raised on the third day. Now, Peter, then Peter. Everybody say, then Peter. Right after he had told him all this, 
I mean, he just turns around to Peter and says, you're the star pupil today. Then Peter (laughs) took him aside and began to rebuke him. There's something about human beings. The minute you give someone an attaboy, all of a sudden they become God. I'm telling you, human beings are very, it is very difficult for the human heart to receive any kind of praise without that praise ascending to the human head. Hmm? It's like helium. (laughs) Praise goes into the heart and then floats straight to the head. And it makes you drunk. You know? It makes you drunk in your own glory. One of the hardest things. Peter, you know, he, he's exalted here for a moment. Peter, flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you. But my father who's in heaven. And you could just see old Peter just like. He's looking over at James and John, you know. And he's going. You guys didn't get it, did you? I got the disciple of the day award. Amen? I mean, when they walked in Jerusalem, he probably had his parking place for the day, you know? Disciple of the day, parking place. Only Peter can park his donkey here, you know? Everybody else got to go over here. He, so he, he, he begins to take him aside and rebuke him, saying, far be it from you, Lord. This shall not happen to you. And he turned to Peter and said, get thee behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me. You're not mindful of the things of God, but the things of man. Jesus turned to the disciples and said, If anyone wants to come after me, let him take up, deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. So Jesus had to come back and do an, he had to come back and reset this thing because the human heart had it puffed right on up and so what happens when the human heart puffs up Satan has an opportunity and he'll grasp it every single time for the son of man verse 27 will come in the glory of his father with his angels and then he will reward each one according to his works now let's go to Matthew chapter 18 verse 15 talking about authority and the spirit of faith. It takes faith to be an authority and it takes faith to be under authority. It takes faith to do both. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you've gained your brother. How many of y'all ever tried that? The rest of you have never had anybody sin against you, or you're doing it another way. I'll tell you how most Christians do this. My brother sins against me. I go and find four or five other brothers and tell them about it first. Never go to that brother. I go to four or five other brothers. And that's, again, it's a, it's a weakness in our human nature. It's easier to gossip than to confront. It's easier to sow uh, discord than to confront. Most people, most of us don't like confrontation. You know, and even, here's what I think. You know, there are some personalities that love confrontation unless they're being confronted. (laughs) They love to give it, but they don't like to take it very well. Amen. But if he will not hear, or it says, if he hears you, you've gained your brother. If he will not hear, take with you one or two more. That by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you as a heathen and a tax collector. Someone say, that means I'm supposed to judge people. Hmm? Now what this, this is teaching the church to judge people. Let him be to you as a heathen and a tax collector. Now I read that for years and I said, well, Lord, what does that mean? 
He said, well, how would you treat a heathen or a tax collector? I said, I would treat them like I would try to win them to Christ. He goes, there you go. You don't treat them like they're okay in God. You treat them like you need to get right with God. That's how you treat him. You need to get right with God, man. You don't tell him you're okay with God when you're in a sin. You tell him you need to get right with God. Just like you'd look at a heathen or a tax collector in that time. We don't have, uh, you know, all IRS agents are not, you know, heathens. We have a lot of great IRS agents who are saints. But in their culture, they were betrayers of their people. And that's how they were looked upon. So he said, treat them like they need to be saved, is what he's saying. Treat them like they're not right with God. That's how you treat them. I don't walk by heathen and tax collectors and go, hey. I walk by heathen and tax collectors and say, can I share Christ with you? I preach repentance to heathen and tax collectors. That's how. And so what, I, what he's really saying is, don't make them think they're okay with God if they're not. When you judge someone's not right with God, you tell them, hey man, that ain't right with God. You need to repent of that. That's what that means. And that's called judging things. If he refuses, if he will not hear, take with you one or two more. Why? There's a principle of truth. In the world that was set by the Father. That in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. There's a principle of truth that it seems that the Lord will not allow two or three witnesses to agree falsely. He has a way of confounding that agreement. And if he refuses to hear them... Tell it to the church. But if he refuses to hear the church, let him be to you as a heathen and a tax collector. Now, think about this. We can't do this in America. I'm sad to say. Back then, if you were a Christian, you went to the church of Jerusalem, right? There was one church. You were in or out. You were in the church of Jerusalem or you were out of the church of Jerusalem? James was your pastor or you didn't have one. But in America, like, there are 130 churches within five miles of this church. And so when you try to enforce church government today, because there's not a faith for submission in the church, most Christians who are self-willed won't trust, you know, or won't, I don't want to say trust, but... I guess it is a matter of trust, won't submit themselves to be corrected. So when they're corrected, you know, there was a, a, a person who came to church here one time, and uh, they were a very gifted individual. And, and uh, one, one, in one service, they operated in tongues, but it was out of timing. And so they were asked, hey, the next time you do that, wait to the end of the song. Wait to the end of that part of worship because there's an appropriate time to switch gears. The Holy Spirit doesn't work against himself. If he's leading people in singing, he's not going to have you give a tongue in the middle of singing. When the singing is over, then we go to the next part. When that's over, we go to the next part. When the offering's over, we go to the preaching. So this person was asked, hey, next time, he bowed up and said, ain't nobody going to tell me what to do. And stormed out the church. Never came back. Now that's how most Americans are. Are you like that? Ask yourself. Judge yourself. Can you be corrected? And then when you are corrected, do you get a spirit of offense on you? Because that's what the next thing happens. Some people say, well, I'll stay, but I'll never. You, there's never you're never the same with them again. They carry that spirit of offense. And they just then they begin to look for an opportunity to leave justified. I'll find something wrong in this church. And then when I leave, I can go around and tell everybody I left because there's something wrong in that church. 
No, you left because you were offended because you were corrected in your behavior. There, there's a culture today, man, that people don't want to be corrected for anything. And that's a scary place to live. Look at verse 18. Assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. That's authority. But you've got to have faith to walk in this kind of authority. What kind of faith did Paul walk in? Paul made a statement one time. He said, you know, two different times in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul said this. This, this Christian was acting up so bad, I delivered him to Satan for the destruction of his flesh that he may learn not to blaspheme and that his spirit would be saved in the day of the Lord. That's authority. And it takes faith to walk in that kind of authority. Now, you can't invoke your own will on that. You can't go around turning someone over to Satan because you've got a personality glitch with them. And that's what some you know, immature believers would actually do that. They would say, oh, I don't like that person. Get them, devil. Get them. You don't have any authority to turn someone over to Satan because you don't like their personality. I'm talking about someone who is literally causing problems, serious problems in the church of Jesus Christ. Someone who's in a lifestyle that is causing serious problems in the, in the body of Jesus Christ. We have authority in the church to bind them. Now how could you do that if you weren't allowed to judge anybody? And if, if this was only for the 11 disciples, then what the heck was the church supposed to do for the next 2,000 years? Raise Peter from the dead and ask him to fix this thing? Hey, Peter! We're going to have a spiritual seance. We're going to call back Matthew and Peter and John and James, and we're going to have a spiritual seance and ask them to come judge between these two fussing Christians because we ain't got enough sense or enough spirit to do it. Hmm? No. This was written to the church. You think Jesus didn't know that the apostles were only going to live about 70, 80 years after he left? Why would he only write a book to 70, 80 years after he left? The church is still going on, dear ones. We're here tonight, and we still got to live together. Here's the thing. We're accountable for the same thing they were. So we have the same authority that they had. If we weren't accountable for what they were, we wouldn't have the authority that they have. But we've been given this authority. Again, I say to you, that if any two of you agree on earth concerning anything they ask, it'll be done. For them by my Father in heaven. Where two or three are gathered together in my name, I'm there in the midst of them. <laughs> this got Peter stirred up now. He's like, okay, uh, Peter. Peter came to him and said, now Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Seven times? Why? We're talking about government here. We're talking about spiritual authority. We're talking about, okay, you just told me that I have the authority to forgive sins or retain sins. Now, how many times do I forgive them? Seven times and they go to hell? But look what Jesus said. I do not say it unto you seven times, but 70 times seven. Anytime someone says, I'm sorry, I repent. You forgive them. I don't care how many times they've fallen off their wagon. I don't care how many times they've done something. The Bible says if they repent, if they ask for forgiveness, then you forgive them. There's no limit to grace. The only limit to grace is repentance. The only thing that limits grace is a refusal to repent. 
Aren't you glad for your own sakes that it's like this? <laughs> I don't know about you, but I would have been disqualified long ago if it would have been seven times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed 10,000 talents. And you know, the, uh, this story goes on to say that, you know, this guy begged the king and the king forgave him. 10,000 talents is over a million dollars in today's economy. Over a million dollars. And so he forgave him the debt. And then he took his fellow servant who owed him $17. And he had him committed, grabbed him by the throat, pay me what you owe. He fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, have patience and I will pay you all. He would not, but he went and threw him into prison. His fellow servants saw what had been done, and they were grieved, and they came and told their master all that had been done. His master, after he called him, said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you have not have had compassion on your servant just as I had pity on you? So in context, Jesus is teaching, yes, we walk in judgment in the church. Yes, we govern in the church. We have authority concerning sins and forgiveness in the church. But compassion is not measured. It's immeasurable. Forgiveness is not limited. It's unlimited in how many times. But there's got to be repentance. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10. We'll wind down here. Now, whom you forgive anything, I also forgive. <laughs> That's authority. Paul looked at his church and said, if you forgive them, I forgive them. If you forgive someone in your church, I forgive them. And I'll say to you tonight as your pastor, if you forgive someone for something, I forgive them. And if I forgive someone for something, you should forgive them. You know, I'll never forget years ago when uh, we had a, a, uh, a division in our church. And uh, to this day, it's such a miracle. My, my beloved sister Karen and, and Pastor Brian, and a lot of people don't know the story, but there was a division in our church. And Pastor Karen and Brian, I had to ask them to leave the church. And I disfellowshipped them for four years. We never spoke for four years. I did not speak to my sister for four years. I did not speak to my brother-in-law for four years. Because they refused to come under church government. And they were in authority. They weren't just members. They were in authority. Pastor Brian was pastoring a church at that time under our leadership. Pastor Karen was leading in the church and and when the spirit of god told me go get them and forgive them the work of repentance is done and i went to them i brought them into the church and i set them in front of the church and i say they are forgiven they are being restored and if i forgive them the fruits of repentance are in their life it's as though they never did it. It's as though they never sinned. And do you know, 75% of that church wouldn't even speak to them. 75% of the church wouldn't even look at them. They would tell me stories about how they would be in Walmart and they would, they would walk past them and say, hey, how you doing? And they'd just turn their head and keep walking. Well, they're the ones who have put themselves in judgment now because they didn't forgive. And they're the ones who are about to be delivered to the tormentors now because they didn't forgive. And it's amazing. 
People say, Dave Chisholm, can you really forgive people? They're pastor in our church. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? You know, that's such a testimony of grace. My gosh. It's as though they never did it. It's as though they never disobeyed me. It's as though they never rebelled against me. It's as though it never happened. I remember even Larry looked at me like, are you crazy? Because <laughs> Larry and me, we've been through a lot together. But I remember Larry looking at me like, are you sure you know what you're doing? You know, I said, trust me. Spirit of repentance is here. The fruit of repentance is here. And I say to this day, the most powerful anointing I've ever experienced in my life in the church of Jesus Christ was the night I sat in their living room and received them back into fellowship. And I drove home at 2 o'clock in the morning, and I'm driving down Route 93, and I'll never forget, I was just bawling, weeping, crying, and I said, Jesus, what did I just experience? And I'll never forget what the Lord said to me. He said, tonight you experience the most powerful anointing in the kingdom. And I said, what is it? He said, the repairer of the breach. I never heard that taught anywhere. But I knew what I had experienced. And the greatest anointing is the repairer, the restorer of the breach. When a human being is reconnected to the life of God, that's the greatest anointing there is in the kingdom. Awesome. Now to whom you forgive anything, I also forgive. For if indeed I have forgiven anything, I have forgiven that one for your sakes in the presence of Christ. Look at verse 11. Lest Satan should take advantage of us. Look, when we mishandle church government, when we mishandle these relational issues, when we mishandle forgiveness and unforgiveness, guess who gets in? The devil. He knows how to take opportunities. And he looks. If you want to find the fruit of Satan, you'll find it growing off a root of bitterness. You'll taste the fruit of the devil off of a root of bitterness. In fact, we're warned, lest a root of bitterness springing up inside you defile the whole soul. Man, I'm telling you, we, we have to guard our hearts in these things. We have to guard our hearts and our lives. Amen. We have to guard our hearts and our lives. As we close here tonight, I just want to challenge you to release your faith to walk and live in the kingdom. Some people have more faith in this world system than they have in the kingdom. And you may have seen things that went wrong or things that happened in the church. And we don't walk in, we don't submit ourselves in the life of the church because the church, everybody in the church behaves and performs perfectly. We do it by faith. It takes faith to submit to the authority of God. It takes great faith. Great faith to submit to the authority of God. Great faith. Come on up. Hallelujah. Stand with me tonight. Jesus. You know, I really believe some of you, would, would, you, you literally can practice this with one another. I would encourage you to practice Submitting yourself to someone. Find, find situations in your life. Find things in your life that, and, and, and literally just say, you know what, I'm going to do that. I'm just going to do that. I'm going to submit to that. Why? Because I need to practice submission. I'm not very good at it. You know how you get good at something? Practice it. You practice it. That's how you get good at it. Practice, practice, practice. And you know what happens? When you, when you learn to submit, you begin to experience a righteous peace 
You will. A righteous peace. There is a security in submission. It really is. It's the way of the kingdom. Now let me say this. The definition of submission is not I agree with you. That's the American definition. But the kingdom definition, in fact, the, even the, it's not even really the American definition. It's a cultural definition which has been redefined. The word submit means to yield oneself to the will of another. The Bible says submit to them who rule over you because they have oversight of your souls. Now, I don't teach this for my sake because the last thing I need to do is have someone else to look after in the sense of the natural. I'm saying this for your sakes because it not only says submit to those who rule over you in spiritual government, it says submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. You know, I submit to people around here all the time. You know how many times I, I say, hey, why don't we do this? And then someone says, you yeah, know, Pastor, we really couldn't do that because this, this, this. I go, oh, okay, I'll submit to that. Because they have a better way or they have another way or they, have, they pointed out something I didn't know. We submit to one another in the daily life things. You know, we watch this worship team submit to one another almost every time they get up here they go out of order on songs there's times where they had five songs they were going to sing but someone got anointed and because they got anointed and it went longer on time that person didn't get to sing their song but they don't storm off the stage like they would in the world system saying I can't believe I didn't get a song. I've seen some churches they did but this group don't do that if they did they wouldn't be up here we just say you know what you need to go over and sit down until you grow up because this is a, a spiritual team of flow. Hallelujah. Lift your hands to heaven. See yourselves in God's divine government. Father, tonight we submit our hearts to you. We submit our lives to you. We submit to your authority and we submit to one another. Lord, help us to have faith to walk in authority to stand under authority. Lord, we want to exercise the greatest faith that you ever saw in the kingdom, and that was one who said, I too am a man under authority. And I say to one, go. And he goes and to another, come, and he comes. And you answered and said, I've not seen such great faith. No, not even in all Israel. As this centurion who understood authority. Father, I pray tonight that you would help each of us walk in a greater dimension of authority first in our own lives and then in the lives of others. I pray that you would help each of us grow up in authority, in, into the head. And that we may begin to experience even the mind of Christ as you called us to. Lord, help us to discern between our will and your will. Help us to discern between righteous and unrighteous judgment. Help us to discern these things. And we give you glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Practice, saints. Find something. The next time you disagree with someone, just practice. You know what? I'm going to submit. Just for practice. Because I need to get better at it. I need to begin to manifest this fruit of the kingdom. Get my prayer team down here. If anybody needs prayer tonight before you leave, please come get prayer. We love you. We bless you. We thank you for coming out tonight, worshiping with us, being hungry for God's spirit and God's word. We'll be back in the morning.